Good evening, everyone. I don't know if it's just me or not, but it seems like time is passing by so fast. It seems like it wasn't but 15 minutes ago that we were smelling all that good barbecue here <laughs> on the Lord's Day. Now here it is Wednesday. Ezekiel 39. <clears throat> Ezekiel chapter 39. I would like to bring a message, Lord willing, I hope the Lord will bring it, on Israel's forgotten prophecy. A prophecy that Israel knew about, had, but forgot all about it, left it aside, and it is still causing problems among us Gentiles even in our day. Israel's forgotten prophecy. Ezekiel chapter 39 and verse number 21. And I will set my glory among the heathen, and all the heathen shall see my judgment that I have executed, and my hand that I have laid upon them. So the house of Israel shall know that I am the Lord their God from that day and forward. What do you get out of that? Number one, that God's going to turn his glory from Israel to the Gentiles. And number two, when he does it, Israel is going to come to know more than they've ever known that God is the Lord. Isn't that amazing? This seems to be something that they had forgotten. John chapter 11. I hope you don't mind licking your fingertips and turning pages because we're going to ransack the Bible tonight and see a lot of scriptures about this. I would like for you to go out the door the same, it, not the same as you came in, but understanding that Israel was told multiple times down through the centuries that God was going to bring his glory to the Gentiles. But that's a prophecy that they let slide. John chapter 11 and verse number 49. And one of them called Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, You know nothing at all, nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not. Now, he was not talking about the atonement. Don't let that get in your head. He was talking about Jesus of Nazareth was a rebel and causing the Jewish people a lot of problems among the Romans. And if we don't do something about him, they're going to come and take away our living. He was talking about killing one man for the good of the whole. But stick with it now. And this spake he not of or from himself, but being the high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation. Listen. And not for that nation only, but that also he should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. That's an amazing passage of scripture, folks. Here was a man who was a high priest. He was going to be overcome by the Holy Spirit to bring forth a prophecy that God would cause him to say, can you look at Proverbs 16, 1 real quick? I'll tell you what it says. It says the answer of the tongue, the preparation of the heart in man, and the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. So God took over this man's brain and made him say something that he intended to convey a specific thing in the murder, the assassination, the killing of Jesus of Nazareth for the good of him and his buddies so that they wouldn't lose their place among the Roman people. Do you ever know of this happening before? Look at Numbers chapter 23. Balak liked to have had a heart attack. Balaam just liked to drove him nuts. He kept, Balak kept telling Balaam to curse Israel. We're just going to read two verses because we've got a lot of scripture to look at. Numbers 23, 
verse 11 and 12. And Balak, that's the king, said unto Balaam, that was a false prophet, What hast thou done to me? unto me? I took thee to curse thine enemies, and behold, thou hast blessed them altogether. The answer, and he answered and said, Must I not take heed to speak that which the Lord hath Every time Balaam opened his mouth, he blessed Israel. He had got a lot of money and a lot of prestige, and the king went out of his way to do everything that he said, built altars, sacrificed lambs and sheep and all that sort of stuff, trying to get him to curse Israel. But every time he opened his mouth, bam, blessing come out instead of cursing. That's what happened here. And here at this late date, just prior to Israel being judged by God and their, uh, their city, the temple and all, would be completely destroyed in 70 A.D. as a result of what they did here. Here was one saying, we uh, must have this one man die for us that the whole nation perish not. Now, verse 51 of John 11, And this spake he not from or of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation, and he prophesied that not for that nation only, but that also he should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. So here he is prophesying that which had been lost and had been left and had been forgotten. But God said, you're not going to forget it. I'm going to bring it back up. I'll do to you, Caiaphas, the same thing I did to Balaam. And even though you mean to say it for uh, the ends that you have in your mind, that's all right. You go ahead and say it like you intend to. Folks, there's a lot of people said a lot of things. God made it work out work out a whole lot different than what they thought it was going to work out. But it was basically doing exactly what Caiaphas said. He was going to bring in the peoples of God scattered. Genesis 35. Genesis 35. <clears throat> verse 10. Israel had forgotten that God was going to bring in the Gentiles. Genesis 35, 10. And God said unto him, unto Jacob, Thy name is Jacob. Thy name shall not be called any more Jacob, but Israel shall be thy name. And he called his name Israel. And God said unto him, I am God. I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply and a nation and a company of nations shall be of thee, and kings shall come out of thy loins. So at the very beginning, when Israel became Israel, when Jacob became Israel, God prophesied unto him that a company of nations shall come out from him. This started from the very beginning. Go back to Genesis chapter 12. What man does Israel... Really hold up and say we're, the, we're of that guy. It's Abraham. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. And the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country. That was the first issue of faith in the beginning of what we know as the Christian church. Get thee up out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, you only need to read Matthew chapter 10 to understand how God has said that to us as well. Unto a land that I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. Listen. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee, and in thee shall all families, all families of what? See, it makes a difference. If you say all families of Israel, changes the whole meaning. That ain't what it said. 
In thee shall all families of earth be blessed. That's what he said to Abraham, or Abram, whose name was changed to Abraham, at the very outset. That's what he repeated to Jacob, whose name he changed to Israel. What about to Isaac? Genesis 18 and verse 18. Genesis 18, 18. No, this is Abraham too, excuse me. And the Lord said, shall I hide, this is verse 17, from Abraham that thing which I do, verse 18 of chapter 18, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all, not the families here, but all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. Now Isaac, chapter 26, Genesis 26, and verse number 4. Isaac went unto Abimelech, it says in verse number 1. That's who we're talking about, Isaac, in verse number 1. Go down to verse 4. And I will make thy seed to multiply as the stars of heaven and will give unto thy seed and all these countries. I will give unto thy seed all these countries. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. That was said to Isaac. That was said to Jacob. Look at chapter 28 and verse number 14. And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Caiaphas had forgot this. He wasn't talking about the blessing of God that was given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He was just talking about how we're going to get out of this mess. The Romans have come, come, come down on us if we don't do something about this rebel who is stirring up everybody. It, the whole world is going after him. But... He being the high priest that year, the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. He may be in hell right now. I don't know. You don't either. But whether he is or not, that Proverbs 16, 1 says his tongue was used of God. Just like Balaam's tongue was used of God. He couldn't say anything contrary to the will of God. Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. And verse 7, <clears throat> Galatians 3, 7. Know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are what? Isn't that something? They which are of faith. Gentile, Jew, not mentioned. European, Ethiopian, you know, Russian, Spanish, Spaniard, whatever. It don't matter. Whoever is of faith is a child of Abraham. Verse 8. And the scripture foreseeing that God would, three words please, now make it five words. And foreseeing that God would God preached before the gospel unto Abraham. What was God's text that Sunday morning, that Sabbath day when he preached to Abraham? What was it? It was, in thee shall all nations be blessed. That was the message. God put it out there on the marquee. On front of the church. Said Abraham, come in. Here's what we're going to hear today. That ain't what way it was. I'm just trying to get your minds to, to think. His message to Abraham was, when he preached to Abraham, 
was, in thee shall all nations be blessed. Verse 9, so then they which be of faith are blessed with faithful Abraham. If you are of faith, you are a child of Abraham. Verse 7, if you are of faith, you are blessed with Abraham. How did Abraham get that understanding? He went to a preaching service. Who was doing the preaching? God was. What was the message that day? It was, in thee shall all the nations be blessed. That was an effectual message by the Holy Spirit that edified Abraham's heart and caused him not to wobble on the axle, but he stayed true and believed God all the way through to the end. John chapter 10 and verse 16. This is the person of the Lord Jesus Christ talking. And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one flock, or fold, and one shepherd. That's Jesus Christ bringing back the awareness that he was going to be the Savior of more than just Israel. There was other sheep that he had that's not of this fold. Not of the fold of Israel. It is amazing to me to read the lineage of the Lord Jesus Christ and to find in that Rahab the harlot, not an Israelite. I got to go home and get my message. I'll be back in a minute. Hold on. I forgot the other woman. Forgive me. Say it. Ruth, Ruth Moabitess. Thank you. And then Tamar was, uh, she committed illicit sex act, acts with Judah, if I'm right about him. But anyhow, Tamar and Ruth, Gentiles. That's the bloodline, the physical bloodline of Jesus of Nazareth. This thing has been declared from the very beginning. But it is a prophecy that Israel chose to forget because they got into an us and them Mindset. You better be careful with it. It still exists today. Us Baptists is saved so them Catholics can't be. I don't know if there might be somebody saved in that or not. That's up to the Lord out of every kindred and people and nation and tongue. All I know to do is if I can find somebody that's of the same faith, same Lord, same baptism, and the same God and Father of us all, they're my brother or sister in Christ. I don't care what the word was on the sign that they passed to go into their house of worship. If you know the Lord, you're my brother and sister in Christ. So this thing is, is, was conveniently lost by Israel. And they got to the place to where they said, just me and my wife, our son John, his wife, us four, no more. That's all there is. And they got to thinking that we're the only ones. They had to deny this prophecy that came upon them from the very beginning. And even Jesus talked about it. And it got them in a mess because they got to the place where they said, we're so blessed. As long as the sun shines, as long as the moon shines, we got God, we're God's covenant people and ain't nothing going to happen to us. They started living like the devil and believing that God was going to take them into his glory. And he destroyed them all. We read you in uh, Ezekiel 39 how that he prophes- God told Ezekiel to prophesy to the fowl of the air and the beasts of the field to come and eat all the flesh of Israel. I'm through with them. I ain't having nothing else to do with them. And that's where our lesson started tonight in verse 21 of Ezekiel 39. I'm going to turn to the Gentiles. I will put my glory among the Gentiles. That's the way that it is. 
Psalm 22. Psalm 22. You ever heard of that psalm? We've heard the 23rd Psalm. What about the 22nd Psalm? Psalm 22 and verse 27. Would you like to read that? Would you read it with Brother Tommy? Don't make him read it by himself. Psalm 22, 27. Okay. David wrote that psalm. That was written some thousand years before the coming of Christ. He understood that. He believed that. It's just the way that it was. And there is, if I could remember where it was, 2 Samuel chapter 23 And since Brother Gary is our Bible readers leader, we'll let him read verses 8 through 39 to us. I'm just kidding, Brother Gary. Don't get upset. I want you to listen. I want you to listen. David wrote that song. Hold your place right there just a minute. Just put your finger down right there and go back to 1 Samuel 22 and verse 1. 1 Samuel 22 and verse 1. This is when Saul was chasing David. 1 Samuel 22, 1. David therefore departed thence and escaped to the, call, to the cave of Dullam, and when his brethren and all his father's house heard it, they went down, to, down thither to him. And everyone that was in distress, and everyone that was in debt, and everyone that was discontented gathered themselves unto him, and he became a captain over them, and there were with him about 400 men. Now, I understand without any doubt that in verse number one, it was his mom and daddy and his brothers and sisters and aunts and uncles and all that that came down there to live in that cave with him. But that's not who we read in verse two that also came with him. It doesn't say of Israel. It doesn't say not of Israel. It's, that's not the issue. The issue was, are you in distress? Are you in debt? Are you discontented? Then gather yourselves unto David and put yourself under his authority and he becomes a captain over them. Now, 2 Samuel 23, beginning with verse 8. Second Samuel 23, 8. These be the names of the mighty men whom David had. The what? Yeah, that's what I said. That sat in the seat chief among the captains, the same was Adano the Esnite. Brother Gary, this is what you're supposed to be doing. Verse 9, and after him was Elias, Eliezer, the son of Dodo, or Do, I don't know how to pronounce it, and uh, the Ahohite. One of the three mighty men, you go on down and read all these. Verse 11, Shamar, the son of Agi, the Hararite. Read on down, uh, all the way down through verse uh, number 39. Jump on down into it. Listen at verse 24. No, don't listen to it because uh, I ain't going to read it. Asahel, the brother of Joab, was uh, of the 30. El Hay. Uh, I said I wasn't going to read it, and here I am trying to read it. But just look at all those names. Look at verse 27. Look at verse 28. Verse 29. Verse 30. Look at all those names. And they don't say the Israelite. They don't say the Benjamite. It don't say of the tribe of Judah. It's listing all kinds of men that went down to David. So we understand and see that David, being a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ, which we're going to see 
hopefully before this message is over, he had a kingdom full of Jews and Gentiles. How did they forget this? How did this come to be a prophecy that was forgotten by Israel? Because they didn't want the Gentiles involved with them. Luke chapter 2 and verse 32. Luke chapter 2. Then verse 32, the prophecy of Simon, when he saw the baby Jesus being brought to the temple. Luke chapter 2 and verse 32. You, would you read that for me? The Bible said this man had been waiting in the temple just like the prophetess had been. And it had been promised him that he would not die until he held the Lord's salvation in his arms. The Holy Spirit was in this man. The Holy Spirit prepared this man. He believed the Holy Spirit. He was a true child of Abraham because he was of faith. He believed God. And when the Lord was in his arms, he began to prophesy. And this is what the Holy Spirit gave to this man to prophesy at the beginning of the life of Messiah. He will be a light to the Gentiles and be the glory of the people of Israel. Isn't that amazing? And yet, God has to overcome Caiaphas and kind of trick him. To make him say something political. But God meant it spiritual. Because the two verses that describe Caiaphas saying that. Tells you that it was God that took over his mouth. Because he was high priest that year. And this was the Holy Spirit causing him to say that prophecy. That he had so easily and conveniently forgotten that the Gentiles were going to be involved with the glory of God. You can quote this, John 1, 29. Can you quote it? John sees Jesus coming walking down by the Sea of Galilee and said, Behold! The of God. Which the sin of the what? World. Ah! Not only did Simon introduce him at his birth... On the eighth day of his, for his circumcision, but the, the forerunner, the human being, only one ever chosen to look at a human being and say, that's God our maker, was led by the Spirit to say that he is the Lamb of God and he won't just take away the sin of Israel, but he'll take away the sin of the world. And everybody can quote John 3, 16, but they ain't got a clue what it means. For God so loved the world, not just Jews. First John chapter 2, I think it is, in verse 2. A brother, Vic, and I can't remember his last name, was in Springfield, mm, Illinois, yeah, I think it was. And uh, he was a very learned man. He used to translate uh, in the State Department Russian language into English and so forth. And he came down to see me and uh, sat in my basement by that wood stove and we were talking about the Lord for a good while. And he said, I'll tell you what I want to do. I want to go back to Illinois and I want to invite every Southern Baptist preacher in the city and tell them this is where your roots are in the sovereign grace doctrine. And we're going to have a big meeting at our church, big feeding Tents out there with all kind of food. 
and I want you to be one of the preachers. And then we're going to have a, a question and answer session. And I'm going to assign you, we're going to have nothing but the five points of Calvinism. We have five preachers, and they're going to take each one of them, take one of the five points. And you got limited atonement. I said, thanks a lot. So here I am up there preaching to, there's 32 uh, Southern Baptist pastors inviting. I don't think, I know there wasn't that many of them that came, but there was a good many of them that came. Because if you offer a Baptist preacher a free meal, <laughs> so I get up and I preach on limited atonement. Then after lunch, we all get back up there and they put us all in chairs, all five of us, and they say, have at them. Every question was come, came to me. I don't think they asked anybody else anything. But they was after that limited atonement. And this is one of the verses they brought up. And it says, 1 John 2, 2, And he is the propitiation, the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. They read that to me and said, what are you going to do about that, preacher? I said, I ain't going to do nothing about it. It's the Bible, and I believe it. They said, how can you believe that and preach limited atonement? I said, because it does not go against limited atonement. It says the sins of the whole world. I said, yeah. And here you are standing in this year, whatever year it was, and saying it's the sins of the whole world, and you're talking about right now. But let's take you back to the time this was written. Sir, can you tell me who wrote this? John. I said, well, what nationality was he? He said, Jew. Okay, we're doing, we're doing good. Just stick with me. Now, here you have a, a Jew who is an apostle. He's telling you that Jesus Christ didn't just die for the Jews, but he died for what? He said, sin of the whole world. I said, what? I didn't hear you. He said, the sin of the whole world. I said, ta-da. It doesn't go against limited atonement. There ain't nobody going to be in heaven that wasn't elected before the foundation of the world. And if you see that's wrong, you're wrong. If you can't put them together and see that they don't contradict one another, then you just got some more thinking and praying to do. But this don't say for the sin of every man without exception. This says every man without any particular nationality or whatever without distinction it says every man without distinction not every man without exception God of course hell has had to enlarge itself if there's one man in hell then that can't be that Jesus died for all the sins of all men or that man wouldn't have went to hell because Jesus blood did the job father was satisfied it was finished. Justification was established. So this can't be saying all the sins of all men without exception. It says he shall die for all the sins of all men without distinction. Jew don't make no difference. Gentile don't make no difference. I got in. American Indian, no, I don't care. Black man from Africa, I don't care. Don't make no difference. He got faith in Jesus Christ. He believe on in, in the Lord Jesus Christ. You're in. He died. He's the Lamb of God that came to die for the sins of the world. And there it is. This has messed us up in our age. And we don't believe the gospel. And we can't believe the gospel. You can't even talk about limited atonement in this nation. Unless you do it in the back room in the corner in a particular religion. Why is it that way? Because the devil has blinded the minds of them that believe not. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ should shine unto them. And because they receive not the love of the truth, God has sent them strong delusion. That they might believe a lie and be damned who receive not the love of the truth. We're in the same mess 
that Israel was in when Jesus said, your temple is your house is left unto you desolate. Ezekiel prophesied to the fowl of the air, prophesied to the beasts of the field. I'm sick of these people. Let them come and get drunk on their blood. I'm turning to the Gentiles. And here we are. Same song, second verse. We were right down in the middle of the same thing that they was in. Second verse, just like the first. We fail to see that Jesus Christ died for all the sins of all men without distinction of those who the Father had elected in him from the foundation of the world. Isn't that amazing? Following along the same route. John chapter 12. John chapter 12. In verse 32. And I, who is this talking? It's Jesus, isn't it? The Lord, the word of God, the person of the word. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all unto me. I know it says men. You can put it in or leave it out. It's in italics. The translators thought it would help the meaning of the verse to put it in. And I don't disagree with them. But it's just like 1 John 2, 2. It doesn't say all men without exception. If I'm lifted up on that cross, in verse uh, 31, he said, the judgment of the world is going to take place when I am lifted up on that cross. Right now, now is the judgment of the world, and now is when the prince of, of the air is going to be cast out. This world will be cast out. Some People are waiting for the devil to be cast out of heaven. That happened at Calvary. And he said, when I'm lifted up on the cross, not only will the judgment of the world be set, not only will the devil be cast out, but I will draw all kinds of men unto me, not just the Jews. He didn't say the house of Israel. If it was the house of Israel, he would have said. But he didn't say it. That's the way that it is. Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, verse 29. Is he the God of the Jews only? Well, it's just going to consider this. Let's just drag this back out into the light. Let's look at this doctrine that has been established since Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. Well, and Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Let's look at this thing and see. I answer the question. Is God the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? And the answer is a three-letter word. What is it? Yes. yes. All you Gentiles ought to be happy about that. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision. Who is that? Israel. It's Israel, the Jews. How? By faith and uncircumcision. Who is that? Gentiles. How do they get justified? Same way, through faith. Do we, make, do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid we establish the law. Ephesians chapter 2. While we're flipping around here through the Bible, do you remember who Paul said he was apostle unto? He's a gospel. He was a preacher that was apostle that was called to go to the Gentiles. That, and, and that's why he got in so much trouble. 
because the Jews had conveniently chosen to forget and block this out of their mind that God said, I will put my glory among the heathen. And everywhere Paul went, the Jews got after him, stoned him, beat him, threw him in jail, did all kinds of things to him. Because he was violating the law of Moses. No, he wasn't. He was establishing it as God meant it to be. They were the ones that were violating the law of Moses. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11. Wherefore remember that ye being in times past Gentiles in the flesh. So the Jews call you what? Uncircumcision. By that which is called the circumcision. That's the Jews. In the flesh made by hands. That at that time ye were without Christ. Being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. And strangers from the covenants of promise. Having no hope. And in the world without God. You want to read me the first two words of verse 13? Woo, glory Mary. Amen, sister. But now, in Christ Jesus, ye who were sometimes, ye who sometimes were far off, that is us Gentiles, you were made nigh how? By the blood of Christ. For he is our peace. This is a Jew talking to you, Gentile. For he, Christ, is our peace, who hath made both Jew and Gentiles one. How, what did he do? He broke down the middle wall of partition between us. Used to live in an old house and had a hallway right down the middle. Come in the front door and a hallway right down the middle. And one family lived on one side and one on the other. And if that hallway had been a wall or a petition, the Lord just come in and knock down that thing and said, we're going to all live together as one. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity. It wasn't enmity from God. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances. For to make in himself of two twain one new man, so making peace. And that he might reconcile both Jew and Gentile unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. And he came and preached to you which were afar off. And to them that were not, to the Gentile and the Jew. For through him we both have ex access by one spirit unto the Father. How many sons are they of God, the eternal Son of God? One. How many fathers are there? One. How many Holy Spirits are there? One. We, for through him we both through him, through Christ, the only one there is. No other name given under heaven whereby you must be saved. Jew or Gentile, you don't come by Christ, you don't come at all. So we come by the Son, the one Son. We both come by the Spirit. We both come unto the Father. Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. And listen. And you're built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. They're our prophets. They're our apostles just as much as they are the Jews. Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord in whom ye also, you Gentiles also, are builded together with the Jews for an habitation of God 
through the Spirit. Way back yonder when I had more radio than I had since, I'd listen to Oliver B. Green, and he said, there's going to be a 1,500-mile square city in heaven, and that's where the Jews are going to be, and us Gentiles are going to be down here in the dirt on earth. I didn't like it. I didn't know how to refute it, but it just didn't seem right in here. And then, and in here was the Holy Spirit saying, uh-uh. So I studied and learned and prayed and come to find out, Mr. Green, you might have been very well purposed. That may be something that you really believed, but I believe this comes from that old stinking Schofield Bible. I believe that's where the lights went out it's when that stinking Bible was published. It took the sovereignty of God out of our minds. It took me a long time to get back to the place where I knew that Jesus was presently reigning Lord. And I thought, Mr. Green, bless your heart. It may very well be that you are in eternal glory with God right now. And if you are, you know as good as I do that, that was a lie. That passage right there is just the fulfillment of everything that God told the Jews beginning with Abraham all the way along. Caiaphas tried to say something political and God said, grab his tongue. Now make him say this. And he flapped his tongue in a way and shaped his mouth in a way that he had to say what the high priest was supposed to say voluntarily in a way that Caiaphas would have been edified by it. By agreeing with God. No, Caiaphas didn't get the blessing. But he got used by God. And being the high priest, the Holy Spirit caused him to say, just like Balaam cursed Israel when Balak paid him a lot of money to, excuse me, Balak paid Balaam a lot of money to curse Israel, but every time he opened his mouth, Balaam blessed Israel. So Caiaphas' mouth was used of the Lord to give us an understanding that although this is a prophecy that Israel has long ago lost, God's going to make him say it right now because it's the truth. And you ain't going to use that tongue for yourself, sir. You are, you are mine. You belong to me. And if you're going to talk, you're going to talk right. And even though he didn't mean to, and if he didn't get straightened out about that, Mm, I wouldn't change places with him right now for a sack full of Chick-fil-A's with fries. My soul. This is the forgotten prophecy of Israel. Isaiah chapter 11. You still with me? <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 11. We read uh, uh, Revelation 5, verse 9 so much that I chose not to read it tonight out of every kindred and nation and people and language. But we read that so much I chose not to read it tonight, but that's another verse. Isaiah chapter 11, <clears throat> verse 10. And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse. Who do you think that is? which shall stand for an ensign or for a sign of the people. To it shall the... Wow. Isn't that something? I mean, it's all in the Bible. Their prophets have been prophesying it. God has been saying it. They open the mouth say something contrary to it, and God makes them say this. Jesus preached on it. Other sheep I have that are not of this fold. But there's going to be one flaw. Isn't that amazing? The man that held a baby Jesus in his arms said, he's going to be the light to the Gentiles. And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse which shall stand for and in sign of the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek and his rest shall be glorious and it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord will set his hand against again the second time to recover the remnant of his people. 
which shall be left, left from Assyria, from Egypt, from Pathos, from Cush, from Elam, from Shinar, from Hamath, and from the islands of the sea. That's you. That's you, the islands of the sea. And he shall set up an ensign for the nations, plural. And he shall assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from That's how you got in, kid. Isaiah 55. Verse 3. Isaiah 55, 3. Incline your ear and come unto me. Here and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. Behold, I have given him for a witness to the people, a leader and commandment to the people. Behold, thou shalt call a nation that thou knowest not, and nations that knew not thee shall run unto thee because of the Lord thy God and for the Holy One of Israel, for he hath glorified thee. Chapter 56 and verse 8. The Lord God which gathereth the outcasts of Israel saith, Yet will I gather others to him beside those that are gathered unto him. Isaiah 60 and verse 4. Lift up thine eyes round about and see all they gather themselves together. They shall come to thee. Thy sons shall come from far and thy daughters shall be nursed by at thy side. God is continually, continually, I'll be back in a minute. God is continuing to prophesy over and over and over again that he intends to have an entire world, irregardless of the middle wall of partition the Jews might build up. God's going to tear it down with a wrecking ball and... God's going to save Jew and Gentiles and everybody that has faith in God is going to be a child of Abraham and we are going to be part of God's fulfilling his prophecy in thee, Abraham, shall all the families of the earth shall be blessed. It's that way. Now, we read in Isaiah 55, 3, that God was going to give unto this true Israel an everlasting covenant, even the sure mercies of David. I want to finish out our time in Acts chapter 2. Was Peter expressly said to be the apostle's Apostle to the Gentiles. We just said who it was, and it wasn't Peter. So the answer to that question is no. Who was put up of Christ's disciples on the day of Pentecost? The apostle to the Gentiles, Paul, no. He's still over yonder learning under Gamaliel. God ain't even brought him in yet. Who was it? Peter. Did Peter have a hard time with Gentiles? Yes. Rise, Peter, kill and eat. Not so, Lord. I ain't having nothing to do with them Gentiles. I ain't going to eat that which is common and unclean. Then he gets to Cornelius' house, and God had showed me not to call any man. He didn't say nothing about beasts. When that sheet came down three times, he learned that God was telling him to quit being such a knuckle-headed, exclusive Jew preacher and learn to preach to whomever God said he was to preach to. Ah. Oh. So, not if, but since it was Peter, and since Peter had such a hard time with the, with the Gentiles, and since Peter was the one that was set up to preach on Pentecost, the first gospel message under the Holy Spirit, like this, then what he's fixing to say about the 
sure mercies of David are going to be astounding. This has got to be the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 2, verse 29. Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David. Now he's dead and buried. And it would be bad if he's buried not dead. But it was he was both dead and buried. And his sepulcher is with us unto this day. Y'all agree with that? Yep, everybody agrees with that. Therefore, not only was a patriarch in verse 29, he was a prophet in verse 30. David was a prophet. We don't think about David that often as being a prophet. We talk about him as being, quote, the sweet psalmist of Israel, unquote. We think about him being, quote, a man after God's own heart, unquote. But he was a prophet. And listen. Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him, what was the oath? That of the fruit of David's loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Solomon to sit on it. That ain't what it said. What did it say? Christ. Christ. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Now, this is Peter who don't really want to go the way of the Apostle Paul and Gentiles and so forth. And here he is bringing forth David and talking about the sure mercies of David and said David completely understood the only way, the only way David's kingdom is going to be an everlasting kingdom as that as it diverges into Christ's kingdom, or as Christ's kingdom envelops David's kingdom. Think. Well, the Jews are coming back, and they're going to build a temple, and David's going to come and establish his kingdom, and they're going to have their kingdom forever. It's fulfilled in Christ. Listen. Therefore, being a prophet, this is Acts 2.30, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. David knew that. That's what that says. David knew that it was Messiah, not Solomon. He, seeing this before, spake of, you read it. The resurrection of Christ. Well, Lord, he mercy. Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, preaches that David knew without any doubt that God's oath to him was, could only be fulfilled in the Messiah. And it says in Acts 2.31, he saw this and he spake, David spake of the resurrection of Christ. When did he spake that? He spake that in Psalm 16 and verse 10. What was David's words that made you understand, Peter, that David spoke of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. Dear soul, that is Psalm 1610, if I'm not mistaken. Thank you. When David wrote Psalm 1610, you can't... You can't study that without understanding what David understood. Well, David believed in the resurrection. Check. I agree with you on that. Is that all you got? Yeah, that's all it says. No, it don't. It says here about that there that David, when he penned that, he was talking about the resurrection of Messiah who would fulfill God's oath to him 
that his throne would be an everlasting throne. That's why God was saying, I'll give you the sure mercies of David. I will connect you to Messiah, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the kingdom of God, according to Daniel, will not be ever turned over to another people. But the saints of God shall reign with him forever, even forever and ever, Daniel says. That's the sure mercies of David, and it's yours and not just the Jews. The apostle to the Jews said it. So his mouth, Proverbs 16, 1, was just as much controlled by the Holy Spirit to say this as Caiaphas' mouth was controlled to say what he said in John chapter 11. But the difference is Peter agreed with it. He wanted to say it. He was used of God. He, and, and, and he was in total agreement and in total submission to the Lord in it. Caiaphas was saying it for a political reason. Peter was preaching for the glory of God. And there you have it. Verse 32. This Jesus has God raised up whereof we all are witnesses. God did it. David died and what happened? Well, what you always do, you put him in the ground and is buried in his bodies with us today. But you can't go and find a body of David's Lord because death could not hold his prey. He was resurrected by God and he's ruling and reigning now on the throne, continuing that throne that God promised David that there would be. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted and having received of the Father of the, Father, the promise of the Holy Ghost, Jesus Christ has shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. For it ain't David who ascended into heavens, but himself said, it's what David said, The Lord, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, said unto my Lord, capital L, little O, little R, little D, sit thou on my right hand. For Jehovah God, the eternal self-existent God, said unto my Lord, the Messiah, you're going to reign and you just sit right here on my right hand. And you're going to sit there for he must reign until I make thy foes thy footstool. Listen. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this they were pricked in their heart. That's the Holy Spirit's work. And said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children. You read me the next phrase. Who were the ones afar off in Ephesians chapter 2? Gentiles. Gentiles. For the promise is unto you Jews that are here presently, this unto your children who may not be born yet, that will believe in him, and to all that are afar off. Yee, that gets me. Even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Ain't that good? You are receiving something tonight. It's more precious than winning the lottery. It's more precious than being cured of a disease. It's, it's, it's more precious than God giving you whatever makes your heart happy concerning physical things. This is God recovering the gospel for you and giving you back a prophecy that Israel forgot and it got them destroyed. Psalm 89. Psalm 89. 
If I was you, I'd be telling God, I sure am glad I came tonight. I am. Psalm 89. Verse 18. For the Lord is our defense, and the Holy One of Israel is our King. Then thou spakest in vision to thy Holy One, and said, I have laid help upon one that is mighty. I have exalted one chosen out of the people. I have found David, my servant. With my holy oil have I anointed him. You should never read that kind of verse with, and just think of David, King David of Israel. You should always think about your heavenly David, the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't want to leave Jesse's son out, but dear soul, that ain't been our problem. Our problem has been we ain't thought about nobody but Jesse's son. Now, we don't want to leave God's son out, our heavenly David. I have found David my servant, and with my holy oil have I anointed him, with whom my hand shall be established. Mine arm also shall strengthen him. The enemy shall not exact upon him, nor the son of wickedness afflict him. And I will beat down his foes before his face and plague them that, that hate him. But my faithfulness and my mercy shall be with him. And in my name shall his horn be exalted. I will set his hand also in the sea and in his right hand and his right hand in the rivers. He shall cry unto me, Thou art my father, my God. You go tell Peter and the rest of them guys, I go to my God and your God, to my father and your father. He said, He shall cry unto me, Thou art my Father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. Also I will make him my firstborn. Isn't that good? Do we need to look up verses about the firstborn? You know that. Romans 8, 29, Colossians 1, 15, and 18. I will make him my firstborn, higher than the kings of the earth. And given him a name which is above every name. My mercy will I keep for him forevermore. And my covenant shall stand fast with him. His seed. That's you kid. His seed also will I make to endure forever. And his throne as the days of heaven. You have had God recover for you a prophecy that Israel conveniently forgot. It didn't sit well with them, and they didn't want no stinking Gentiles involved with them. But Ruth and Rahab, thank you, were in the lineage of Messiah, Gentiles. God said, I know this fig tree is good. It's good culture. But you see that wild fig tree over there? That thing's good too. So we went and got some limbs off the wild fig tree and come over and grafted it into the domesticated fig tree. And he said, now nah, look at the fruit. That's you. Keep on bearing fruit, you Gentile.